anyway, let's talk about essentially making social engineering tests actually useful. Um, you know, frankly, let's try to get the right keys. Okay, so frankly, you know, I basically think. Wow, starting off well. Anyway, so let me start talking before this whole thing goes bad again. So here's the thing. When I do, so I pretty much think social engineering tests are a waste of money, time, effort, and so on. You know, and frankly, I made my reputation based on this. I was on Forbes magazine. I gave presentations at DEF CON and everything else because I was a great social engineer. One time I delivered a presentation and said, this is the seminal work in social engineering. At the time, I had to look up what seminal meant and what social engineering meant. That's how bad it was. Because, you know, frankly, to me, it was just like, oh, I'm from New York. I'll just do what somebody from New York does, which is kind of lie to people to get through stuff. So that's kind of what I did. I mean, along the way, I've taken over electronic funds transfer systems from major banks. I've stolen nuclear reactor designs. I don't have it on here, but one time I kind of... Um, broke into a CIA front operation. I didn't know what it was at the time, but it was kind of cool to learn what it was after the fact. But, you know, and all this stuff, just because it's like, it was cool, it was fun. It was like I had so much success. But then one day I was sitting there, and it was like, you know, at first, the first few times you do it, it's like a rush to steal a billion dollars. After a while, it kind of gets old. There was one time where we stole the nuclear reactor designs, and then we were sitting around, and the orders were going, Okay, I wrote, what, let's go for HR data. I'm like, whatever. They're like, you don't seem excited anymore. I'm like, seriously? You think I'm going to be excited about this? It's, you know, the sad part was it was getting way too easy. And I just lost all my fascination with stealing billions of dollars, which sounds really, really stupid. But again, this is what happened. But, you know, the reality, frankly, when I was doing these social engineering tests most of the time, I didn't need the test to know what I was doing. How many people do security assessments in general and social engineering and stuff like that? How many of you, in all honesty, could walk into an organization and tell them 90% of the problems they have within the first 30 seconds? You know, I, I'm not making anything up. You walk in, you see people, like you're wearing a badge, you're like the only idiot wearing a badge at this event. And then, so what do you do? You put your badge in the pocket because nobody else is wearing it. You walk around, you see a whole bunch of desktops left open and everything like that. And then it's like, wow, I'm going to go ahead and do a social engineering test. It's like, big deal. I'm going to point out everything I just noticed in 30 seconds, but yet I'm going to hand them something that looks really, really valuable. But, you know, the penetration test at the end of the day was a waste of time because we know what we're going to find 90% of the time before we start doing anything. Now, this is a serious question. At the end of the day, are you a security professional or are you a hacking? How many people consider themselves hacking professionals? Okay, good, no criminals in the audience. Okay, the rest of you, let's assume, are security professionals. Your job as a security professional is not to highlight how much things are screwed up. Your job is to fix how many things are screwed up. And there's a big difference because, in all honesty, you know, I like... I hear people like praising hackers and all, oh, these hackers, we should make them fix it. It's like, no, if they were hackers and they knew how to fix it, they wouldn't be breaking into stuff half the time. Because the reality of the situation is it's infinitely easier to break something than it is to fix it. I mean, how many people here can break a light bulb if I ask you to? You know, how many people can fix the light bulb, put it back together, or can make a new one? Nobody. Just because you know how to break something, it doesn't mean you know how to fix it. And that's part of something like a lot of people who perform social engineering tests are missing. It's like really easy to point out that, gee, you know, a gener there was a fire and they, for some reason, had water going over their computer room, which is bad. But anyway, for, so for some reason, and then they left the door open to air it out. Then you walk in the open door that they left open to air out and you look like a genius. It's like, no, it didn't make you a genius. It made you an opportunist that took advantage of their misery. And that's what a lot of crime is. That's not what security is, because the fact of the matter is, bad things happen where you people leave doors open for good reasons. I'm not saying every reason's a good reason, but things happen. You're going to stumble upon happenstance where there's that one little secret 
that somebody doesn't notice, like, oh, I'm, one day I'm going to go in when the security guard went to the bathroom or something like that. You know, so what do you do? You tell, okay, don't make sure the guard locks the door when he goes to the bathroom. Congratulations. How much, you know, how much is that worth, the tens of thousands of dollars, to do it? You could have told them that before you started doing all these tests. But anyway, your job is to leave things better than where they were when you found it. Just highlighting how much you screw things up, because, you know, a lot of you said you did social engineering. How many of you think it's really easy to just totally fix the organization based upon what you found in social engineering? Nobody. I mean, seriously, a lot of people sitting here doing it. It's like, well, I broke into this organization. Look at this great information I got. It's like, okay, you found one, well, yeah, I don't like calling users idiots, but let's say you found one person that's a product of their so security awareness program, which by default makes them an idiot. And in that case, that makes you a great social engineer. It's like, no, you found the one person. And how do you know if that's one person that just got the job the other day, a temporary, or somebody who's been there for years and representative of the entire organization? Most of the time, you don't. You know you found your one way in and you found your one gotcha. And that's kind of part of the whole problem. Security engineering tests, the way most people perform them, are a game of gotchas. It's about finding that one little trick to get you in. It's not about seeing the overall you know, state of security in the organization. It's finding that one little trick that gets you in. And sometimes you find that one little path of success, and even if everything around you is a fortress, you find that one path of success, and it makes the organization look like a bunch of idiots, despite the fact it's one person who failed, not the organization as a whole. Now, sometimes, so I'm trying to be not totally unpolitically correct, but, um, you know, frankly, a lot of these tests, you know, you go in there and you grab them by the crown jewels and you hand them the crown jewels. Now, if some company actually needs the crown jewels handed to them to make the point, that's great that you found that, and I applaud you. The fact of the matter is, most companies kind of already know they're screwed. Sometimes a CISO comes to me and says, Ira, my boss doesn't think there's a problem, or he thinks there's a problem, but it doesn't equate to anything. It's like, so I need you to come in and, you know, come in and find something really, really devastating. It's like, okay, sure, I'll do that. On the other hand, if they want me to actually provide long-term value, I'm going to not just look at social engineering, but I'm going to look at, okay, what's the awareness program? I'm going to start with a whole bunch of other stuff before I even start thinking about social engineering. Because, again, I don't need to perform social engineering to know that a good portion of the, of a good portion of the employees have no idea how to protect their sensitive information. They'll give away their password in a heartbeat and so on. But you've got to look at, if, assuming it's not just they want the crown jewels, you've got to go ahead and look on to what the real problems are. Because at the end of the day, gotchas are worthless. If I tell you, let me give a good example. Um, okay, so my friend Stan, I, sometimes I work with this guy. Stan is a Russian defector. And he was a colonel in Russia's GRU. He was their top spy master in the Washington, D.C. for a point in time. Stan has these, um, can I curse? Does anybody mind if I curse? Okay, Stan comes up and he's like, he gives me these what the fuck moments. And I'm serious, I'm like Stan. He's like, Ira, there are black duck eggs on the menu. I'm like, the fuck? And he's like, Ira, my naive American friend. He goes, don't you know, black duck eggs, delicacy China. I can't get black duck eggs in San Francisco, let alone this little piece of shit town in the middle of nowhere. And I'm like, okay, now it's beginning to make sense because you know how China works. They're like, again, Stan's primary target while he was a GRU operative was China. And Stan basically, like, we would go around and Stan would say, he does the counterintelligence, I do the black bag, I have other people who do security work and so on. But what happened was Stan would go overhead and do these black bag operations or Stan would do the counterintelligence assessments, and we would drive around. He's like, I don't know, what's that over there? What's that? I'm like, leave me alone. Anyway, but then he comes up, and he's like, okay. And he's like, oh, Chinese restaurant one. So he calls me up. He goes, I don't know. Well, Chinese restaurant number one, food, go in there. Food, you know, people friendly, food not so good. I go to Chinese restaurant number two. Chinese restaurant number two, people. Very, people not so friendly, they say me with my funny Russian accent, all of a sudden they get very tight. But they have menu written only in Chinese, Chinese delicacies I can't get in San Francisco, cheaper than on the streets of Beijing here. So Stan essentially found a Chinese front operation operating against across the street 
from the main research and development center of a Fortune 5 company. And then what, the, what do they do if you know Chinese intelligence operations? They go ahead and they basically figure out how can they get people of Chinese descent who are probably first generation Chinese, if not just immigrants, sitting inside their organization and filter them out. So my friends, are you here on a visa? Are you here, you know, are you just like temporary? Do you have family in China? Would you like your family to stay healthy in China? And so on. And that's how they recruit. So Stan found a Chinese intelligence operation. He's like, I don't know, by the way, 25% discount if you hold meeting in their back room. I'm like, I bet you can negotiate it for free. So anyway, but that's the type of stuff. Now that's a good piece of information, but at the overall expense, did that do anything? I mean, there was one time where Stan calls me up. He's like, so we went to, like, drove around. We went to lunch one day. He's like, Ida, I go back to the restaurant where we have lunch. And he's like, there are these women that bring their work there with these very hungry eyes. And if I was back in the employee of my old employer, I would have to approach them. I'm like, that one's on you, Stan. I'm not going to touch that. But, you know, he was talking about women who hang out that seemed to think Stan was attractive. Okay, so here's how to take over a nuclear reactor, essentially, or power grids, the power grid more than nuclear reactor. So anyway, here's what happened. Somebody came to me to do social engineering tests. They're like, Ira, we have a contract to get into this energy company. And essentially, once we're in, we're good. We have all the tools we need, like zero day attacks and everything we would need to get in there. But we don't know how to get in. I go, what information do you have? They're like, well, the only thing we really have is a distribution list because people who have the SCADA software, there's a user group for people who use the SCADA software, and those would be the people who work on the, the SCADA system. And I go, anything else? They're like, no. I go, okay, so here's what we're going to do. I did open source research, found out the company was going through a big merger and acquisition. So I said, now what can I do? They're like, you could do anything. They think there's no way we're going to get in. I go, anything? They're like, anything. So what I do is I go, okay, we're going to take advantage of the merger and acquisition. So I put together, um, well, we set up a, a web server. And the web server was essentially company, company-hr.com. And then we had the distribution list. And again, given that they were going to go ahead and go through a merger and acquisition, I sent a message that basically said we're going to have a worst of both world benefits package. So if company A gets 10 days a year off, company B gets 15, new company gets 10. If company B gets full health care, company A gets partial health care, we go for company A health care and so on. So of course what happened was I sent the inflammatory message over. Um, they ended up like clicking on the message, would come back with a web request for the web server. The web server would go ahead and return a 404 and malware onto the systems that they were working on. So once we had the 404 and malware on there, that basically gave us full system control of the systems that were on the SCADA network. And that was kind of cool. Um, anybody want to guess what the hit rate was on that you know, phishing message I sent in? Um, try a close to 10,000% hit rate. Because what happened was the people were inflamed. They got the 404 message. Then they forwarded it to their friends who forwarded it to their friends who forwarded it to their friends. And the test had to be shut down in two hours. Remember, I said, can we do anything? They're like anything. So anyway, that was the way you get, I mean, pretty much we probably have full control of the system because if you know about SCADA software, even if it's like for a power grid, it's like basically software put on a PC and, you know, nobody updates those PCs and they probably got all over the company. I didn't check. I, again, my job was just to get them in. But what did that prove? It proved the SCADA software was out of date and open to viruses? Yeah. Did, I, did you need me to tell you that? Pretty much I could tell you. If you are involved in SCADA systems, 80% of those systems nobody ever bothers updating. You know, just look at what happened with WannaCry because people were still using like Windows 95 or whatever it was. You know, one port open to the outside world, sure, I didn't need to do that. Employees susceptible to spear phishing, taking advantage of a merger, yeah. I don't need any of this to tell you that the company would have been screwed up. But yes, they needed to see it could happen, but the end result, what was it? It's like, well, gee, update your operating systems and tell people not to click on spear phishing messages. That was the best that could come out of the lessons learned. You know, I have about four different social engineering exploits because, frankly, I know some of you, you just want to, you're just here to find out how to do better social engineering. I'm not delusional. So anyway, I have some tests that, I'm trying to figure out, what time is it? 
320. OK, I have time for at least three of them. So anyway, here's how you take over a bank CFT system. Um, I know this looks, and this is not just calling somebody random person up. When I do a social engineering test, I call them more espionage simulations because I have a goal. I don't just go in there and say I want sensitive information or I want access. I need to know what specific target information we want. In this case, the bank wanted us to specifically target how to make financial transactions in the bank. So what happened was, you know, well, this was a while ago where not everything was completely online, but went ahead, called up the local office. I live in the D.C. area, and around the Washington, D.C. area, every company has a lobbying office. Called up the lobbying office for this large bank, say, hey, can you mail me a telephone directory, and can you give me a local, no, actually, I didn't get a telephone directory. Can you give me the local, the toll-free telephone number for your organization? And by the way, do you have a copy of the annual report? Can you send it to me? They gave me a link online where I got it from there. So anyway, called up the toll-free telephone number, and then I figured out I need background information. When you're doing a social engineering attack and you want to get business value, you need to understand how does the business do internal transactions. So what I did was I called up the graphics department. I said, hi, my, I'm an executive. I need some basic, you know, I need a presentation to look pretty. And they're like, well, email us the presentation, make sure it's in PowerPoint, and then give us your employee ID number and department number. I'm like, okay, employee ID number, department number. Then I went ahead and I also called up the mailroom. I go, hi, I'm an executive, I'm traveling. I need to know how can I send something back to the company overnight. I don't want to charge it to my customer. We're already charging them enough. They're like, okay, well, here's, the, here's our FedEx account number. I'm like, I didn't ask for that, but thank you very much. And then, by the way, in the comment, in the comment section, put down your employee ID number and department number so we know how to charge it back. So now, from two different sources, I knew that to do a transaction inside the organization, I would need employee ID number and department number. I also did a side call that's irrelevant to this string, but you know, to the help desk, and the help desk asked me for the employee number as well. So I knew that employee ID numbers were critical to doing business inside the organization. So anyway, what happened was I had the information, and then I looked through the whole um, you know, internet source and got you know, like their corporate directory tells, or sorry, the um, annual report tells who's Mr. Big Executive, what deals were they proud of, and so on. So I got the name of somebody who's like a big executive, kind of like higher than halfway up their food chain. And I called up and I called up the operator. I said, hi, how do I get a telephone directory, like a physical hard copy telephone directory? I go, she's like, well, the mailroom distributes them. I go, okay, can you transfer me there? So I call up the mailroom. I go, oh, and by the way, what I did was I had to get a high-level executive. I had to start fishing around. And I knew I need employee ID number and department number. So what I did was I found the high-level people inside the annual report. I go, and I got, of course, got the secretary. I go, hi, my name's Steve. I'm with Human Resources. We're putting together a new employee newsletter. We found out that your boss did this big um, $100 million bond issuing, and we want to feature him in this new employee newsletter we're going to generate. And it's like, you think your boss would want to participate and be highlighted? She's like, oh, yeah, he'll be very excited. I'm like, good. So then I start going, so I just need some basic information. It's like, so what's his name? How long has he been with the company? Does he have a nickname or so on? And then I went on. And then what happened was I said, OK, well, I think I have enough for the article because it's just going to be quick. I go, by the way, what's your boss's employee ID number just in case I need any information since I'm with HR, I can look it up. And she gives me the employee ID number. Then I have somebody call back to that woman and I go, hi. Um, you know, we're with corporate IT. Can we just verify the department number for your, or for your off specific office because we have a problem? And then they get the department ID number, so, you know, department number back. So anyway, then I call up the, te you know, uh, mail room. I go, hi, I'm Mr. Big Executive. I need my subcontractors to get a copy of the telephone directory. I know you're going to need my employee ID number, which is this. I know you're going to need my department number, which is that. I know you're going to need a FedEx number, which is this. Um, do you have any questions? And I'm sure they cursed me out after I hung up. But the next morning when I got to my office, there was a telephone directory waiting for me. So I was kind of happy. So as you go through the telephone directory, if you ever worked with, anybody here ever worked with like a large bank of some sort? Okay, so you people can verify that anybody who's not a teller or a security guard is a vice president of one level or another, right? <laughs> So everybody, and they like to make sure they know which vice president is which and so on, so they have different ways of highlighting everybody in the telephone directory. 
And I started going through, and one thing I found out was that there was, um, there was a new hire office in there. And also I found out who kind of worked where, and I needed to start picking out, well, I need st strategic names and employee ID numbers to fish around. So I looked at one Mr. Really Big Executive, and I got his employee ID number and department number using similar ploy. I saw somebody in the org chart kind of worked for that person. So I called that person up. I go, hi, my name's Steve. I'm with travel. I have your travel package to San Francisco. Um, you know, do you want to pick it up or have me send it over? They're like, I'm not going to San Francisco. I go, oh, do you want to? He laughs. I go, what's your name? He goes, I go, what? oh, what's your name? What's your employee ID number? I go, oh, I've got the wrong John Smith. Sorry. So anyway, then I went down. I had a whole bunch of information like that, asking people if they want to pick up their travel packages, just saying you're the wrong, per you know, I have the wrong person. So then what happened was I found out there was a new hire office, and I called up the new hire office administrator who was listed in that telephone directory, and I claimed to be one of the peons who worked for Mr. Big Executive, and I waited till it was like 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I called up and I go, hi, I work for Mr. Really, Really Big. Mr. Really, Really Big wants to have new employees in his office because he wants to implement this new program to have lunch with new employees to welcome them to the company, and I need to get 15 new hires in his office tomorrow morning, and I need the names of everybody who started in the company within the last three weeks. And anyway, and there were like a whole bunch of help wanted ads, so you kind of knew that they were going to be new hires. Anyway, the woman's like, can you call back, you know, tomorrow when the new hire supervisor's in? I go, no, I told you, I need these people probably before that person gets in. I'm like, okay, hold on. Then she starts like reading me names, and I got to admit, I was like, it's working, I can't believe it. And then all of a sudden, so she starts going, and then about 10 names in, all of a sudden she's going, and I realize it's working. I go, oh, by the way, can you give me their employee ID numbers in case I have a problem finding them? And they're like, okay. She, and then like a little while, she's like, what's your name again? And then she's like, what's your employee ID number? And since I already knew, I had it ready, and you know, she's like, okay. Anyway, then she reads me the number for the last three weeks. I got like 75 names. That was a really good start. So anyway, based on that information, then what I would do is I'd call those two, you know, 75 people up, and i go, hi, my name's John. I'm with the IT security department. Um, we found out that you, you know, came on board in the last three weeks, and we haven't been able to give a, a security awareness briefing to your, during your new hire orientation. Do you have five minutes? And they're like, okay. And I'm like, okay, good. I'm like, okay, so given that we're doing this one-on-one -on -one individually over the phone, I can tailor it to you. So I need some basic information. I go, okay, what's your name? What's your employee ID number? What department are you in? What's your department ID? You know, what is your specific job title? You know, basic information, because nobody's covered this before as far as I know, but there's like a whole human elicitation skill when you look at espionage. What you're supposed to do is you work people into saying yes with a lot of small pieces of information. So everybody was giving me, everybody gives their name, everybody gives their employee ID number because it's embedded on everything else you do inside the organization. Then you ask for a whole bunch of other information. So slowly I started asking them for more and more sensitive information. So what computer system do you use? Do you just use your PC or do you log into other systems? What's the name of those other systems and so on? Okay, for your, for your account with this user ID on this system, what's your password on that? Anyway, the first time I got like one of these on a financial system, woman goes, Felix. I go, Felix? I go, do you have a cat? She's like, yeah, how'd you know? I go, never mind. You might have to be old to understand that one. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, all of a sudden, it's like starting to do this. And it just took off from there where everybody was doing it because I had the information. I knew they started recently. Slowly escalate the interactions with them until you get to the more critical thing, information like the password that you're going for. And then what happened was, once I got the more critical information like password and whether or not they had like multi-factor authentication or anything, then I started to have to bore them to death. Because I had to make them forget that they gave me anything sensitive. So I'm like, okay, let me, uh, thanks for the information. Now I could give you the presentation directly to you. Um, okay, make sure that at the end of the day you turn off your computer systems. You know, if there are any automatic updates, please do that. Please do not write down your passwords at all. Please do not give your passwords out over the telephone, yada, yada. And nobody picked up on that. But literally, got more than enough information. I mean, when I first did this, you know, people were saying it's like, 
oh, well, I know I had the ability to make transactions because the company freaked out. I never did it. People were saying I transferred two cents just to prove I, I never did that. But anyway, that's kind of the whole status on how things are done. Now, the reality of the situation is, oh, yeah, I forgot there's like a little bit of like getting remote access to the company. I was able to get that, too. I got the, compu the company to actually send me a computer. I called it, you know, because people are like, this is end users. I actually called up the IT department in the help desk, and I basically said, I'm Mr. Big Executive. I'm traveling. My computer crashed, and I'm trying to use other people's computers. I'm here trying to get a $10 million bond offering going. I look like an idiot. And, you know, can you please help me? They're like, okay, well, the pro why you're not able to log in is you need this VPN software. I go, PVN? They're like, no, VPN. I'm like, what do I need? Do, can I have the people? They're like, no, we'll just send you a new computer. I'm like, okay, thanks. So anyway, with the new computer, I was able to log directly into their financial transaction systems and so on. So anyway, that was kind of fun. But anyway, their attack cost us nothing. Pretty much, you know, this is your job. I don't have to highlight this stuff. Um, how do you steal nuclear reactor designs? That's kind of pretty easy, too. So I realize a lot of you aren't going to be able to read this. It's kind of hard from, uh, well, you're probably, I'm just going to go through how I did this. So what I had to do first was break into the company's corporate headquarters, and I decided I wanted a company badge, a real badge. So what I did was they had a nice campus-like facility on the outskirts of New York City. And, you know, you go there, and then they get up to the guard gate. I go to the guard gate. I go... And the guard's asking, like, you know, let me see your badge to drive on. Um, the guard comes over. I go, I forgot my badge. Can I show you my business card? Because what I did was the night before, I went to a local restaurant and fished out a business card for somebody who worked at the company. And I told the guard, it's like, I don't have it. It's like, here's my business. He's like, okay, go ahead. Anyway, then they had, like, a garage that was under the corporate headquarters building. And they had one of those gates that goes up and down. But it stayed up just long enough that if somebody in front of you drove in, you could drive in right behind, right behind them. Then they had one, an access card to go up into the building. But of course, everybody was entering the building at the same time. I went up in the building. I found an empty office. Did, how many people ever saw the movie Secret of My Success with Michael J. Fox? Old movies are incredibly valuable. In Secret of My Success, Michael J. Fox essentially goes to a large company, finds an empty office, and gets it set up as his own, just by saying, this is my office, get a nameplate put up, and all that stuff. So anyway, I went ahead and I basically picked up the phone. I go, hi, I was just assigned this office and this telephone number. What do I need to, you know, get voicemail working and everything? So anyway, I set up the voicemail and all that sort of stuff. Then I had an accomplice with me that was supposed to do the hacking. So then I took my accomplice down to the front desk and we came not from the visitor side but from the employee side and I asked the people, hey, how do I get into this organization, you know, how do I get badges? How do me and my friend get badges? And they're like, oh, the security office is over there. So I walk into the security office. I go, hi, we need badges. And the person goes, it's like, um, he's like, okay, fill out these forms. And we're like, okay. So we fill out the forms. They need an authorization signature. I sign his to authorize his badge. She signs mine to authorize my badge. And then we walk and get our pictures taken. And then we have headquarter badges. With headquarter badges for a global 10 company, you can walk into any facility around the world for that organization. So anyway, then we got on a plane, flew to the other side of the country, and we got there, and we had auditors following us around. So we're sitting having dinner with the auditors, and the auditor's like, we're in the middle of nowhere. Do you want to go over to the company, you know, the facility, and look around? We're like, sure. So anyway, they're in their car in front of me, and I follow them to the facility. I had my car with my accomplice. So anyway, they drive up to the front gate of the facility, and they go to the guard. It's like, I don't know what they did, but then the guard sends them around to a building on the left. Anyway, and then I see them go there. Then I drive up, I show my badge, and I go up to them. They're like, do you know where you're going? I go, well, I think it's building 38. He's like, okay, straight down the road about a quarter mile, make your first left turn, second right, and you're good. I'm like, okay. I go, why are those guys going over there? He's like, oh, those guys, they're auditors. We make sure we know where they're going. I'm like, good job. So anyway, what happened was we drive in, and we're like waiting for them. And finally they show up. We go into the building where we know we're going to work the next day, and we find empty offices with the right connections, and we say we're going to set up there. So then we go ahead, and next morning we go, and I tell the auditors, you're getting in my car because I'm not waiting for you guys to sign in every day. So I drive up, I show my badge, and the guards are just like, there, like this because they don't want to slow down the morning rush hour. I didn't even need the badge. It was that upsetting to me. 
So then what happened was we get in there, and then I pick up the phone. The auditors are like, so we're going to engineering. I go, hold on. I picked up the phone. I go, hi, where's the graphics department? I called up the operators. The operators are like, I'll connect you. I go, I don't want to be connected. I want to know where the graphics department is. And she's like, okay, it's building whatever, you know, third floor, room, whatever. I go, okay, so I walk over there. I walk into the graphics department. I go, hi, who does the nuclear reactor proposals? And they go, try the other side of the room. I try the other side of the room. I go, who does the nuclear reactor proposal? They go, try across the hall. I go to across the hall. I go, who does the nuclear reactor proposal? They go, try downstairs. Did anybody see Star Trek IV, the one with the whale, the movie, where Chekhov was walking around San Francisco going, where are the nuclear vessels? Where are nuclear vessels? I felt like Chekhov. You know, what do I have to do to be caught here? So anyway, there I was. I finally get to this room. I walk in. I see, you know, there's a glass window to the room. I see they're using these Unix computers. I walk in and I go, hi, do you do the nuclear reactor proposal? They go, yes, we do. I go, you people are hard. They're like, do we smell or anything? I go, no, you seem perfectly fine. They're like, okay. I go, well, I'm, you know, I'm with the security department. We're trying to make sure your proposals are all secured and everything. I go, do you, are your proposals stored sent on your s individual systems or are they on a server? They go, they're on a server. I go, do you know where that server is? They go, no. I go, can I sit down at your computer for a quick second? So anyway, get on the computer, and I pull up a command tool, and I just type in, you know, more slash etc slash host, which says what, you know, drives are mounted, where they're connected to. And one of them is literally named proposal server. I get the proposal server name. I get the IP address. I go, I thanks. That's all I need. They're like, come by anytime. I go, I sure will. So anyway, then I run, I call up my friend, you know, my accomplice, call him up on my walk back, you know, in the middle of the desert parking lot. And I give him the IP address, the name of the system. It takes him 10 minutes to get back. He looks up, goes, OK, got it. Then he goes, by the way, should somebody from India be logged on these systems? I go, probably not. So anyway, um, you know, so it turns out he started looking around because he does, you know, we don't just do a pen test. We do triage and everything. And he's like, and we, he looked in the audit logs, found somebody was logging on from India. And we found India hacking into their system, stealing all their data. That was a separate issue. Um, let's see, I don't know if I have time for this, but one case I do want to point out, if this is how you steal like high tech, you know, patent type billion dollar data. And what happened was basically did open source research found information out about the company. Um, based on that, I got a big temporary badge. They hired me as a temporary employee to see how much I could steal really quickly. So what happened was they're like, yeah, because they had seven cases of industrial espionage in the previous three years before I got there. Two were sponsored by the Chinese government. One was sponsored by the Indian government. And the company employees didn't want to do anything, so they really did want a gotcha game. But in this case, so they wanted to prove that an idiot off the street can rob them blind, not just China or India. I'm like, thanks for choosing me as your idiot. <laughs> so, you know, I basically called up, like, you know, Based on the open source information, I found out who was in charge of their multi-billion dollar product. I called up that person. That person went ahead and I said, she's like, I can meet with you for an hour. Otherwise, I'm going to be out of town for too long. So I'm like, OK. I got in my car and rushed over to the building. And then I my badge didn't let me in because I didn't have access to the buildings I didn't need, which was a good security thing. Anyway, somebody went out. I went in. And then I sat there, met with a business manager who must have assumed I was a wonderful person. I'm like, where's all your data? She's like, well, everybody has their own. I go, it's got to be someplace where they're kept. And she's like, we have these meeting minutes. And in the meeting minutes, lots of guys see the meeting minutes. She says, I'll have my secretary give you a copy of all of them. So I got a copy of all the meeting minutes with all the critical data. Then she's like, we also have government affairs people, and we also have business managers who track everything for, our, you know, for senior executives. And I'm like, OK. Um, so I got the name of the business manager. I got the name of the government person. I went to, you know, I looked through the meeting minutes. Nothing seemed to stick out. Then the net afternoon, I met with the government affairs person. I'm talking to this woman, and she's like, well, our documents have to tell the government how we make stuff because we have, a, you know, EPA-related issues and so on, runoff. So they have to review our manufacturing process. I go, can I see, you know, I go, how frequently are these documents backed up? She's like, I don't back them up. I go, does somebody back them up? Those are valuable documents. She's like, well, maybe the admins do. I go, well, if you want to, if you give me a copy of your documents, I'll lock them in a safe on a you know, little USB drive or something. She's like, 
Is she look nervous? I go, well, you look nervous. I go, let's just do this. Can I come behind your desk for a second? She's like, sure. I go, can you click here, click there, click here, click there? And what I did was I made sure that her hard drive was now shared to the entire network. So then I went back. I ran back to my desk. I'm navigating to her system. And all of a sudden, I got to her, the, like her subnet. And all of a sudden, it said, enter user ID and password for this subnetwork. And I was locked out, and the CISO was behind me laughing his head off, saying, stop you. So anyway, then there I was, and I started looking through the meeting minutes again. And in the meeting minutes, there was a message from that government affairs person that said, the draft document's ready to go to the government and is available for your review. Please use your own user ID with the following password to log on. I was like, no way. Then I'm like, way. So I started logging in. I copied like you know somebody randomly off the distribution list, first initial, last name was the general sequence, you know. And then lo and behold, I had access to one document that gave you information how to make a multi-billion-dollar product. Then I looked. I found out I had a directory access, which gave me five different products the company was working on. So that was kind of a good day. So then what happened was then there was the business manager the next day, and this guy hated security with a passion. I walked in and said, hi, he just hired the new head of information security. I'm supposed to protect all your most valuable data. I don't know where it is. I don't know what it is. Can you please help? The guy was like, you know, I spoke to some security guy three months ago. I haven't seen him since, and I'm happy about that. I go, well, I have to do my job. He's like, you know, I think security stands in the way of innovation. I'm like, you're a fucking ray of sunshine, aren't you? And then we're like sitting there going back and forth and everything. And he's like, what about this? Security guy three months ago. I go, what about that? So I talk to the, you know, uh, security stands in the way of innovation. I go, okay, how about this? You tell me where your directories are, and I won't have to bother you ever again for your entire employment, which if I have anything to do with it will be the next 10 minutes. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't. That was a separate thing. But anyway, so I'm like, just where are your directories? He goes, I don't know. I go, okay, how about this? Log off of your computer. And then I'll watch you log back on, and based upon where and when the icons pop up on your screen, I'll be able to tell where the directories are. You know I'm lying, I hope. <laughs> but anyway, I was just trying to see user ID and password. I got the user ID, which was expected, but then the password was just, pot, you know, I didn't get it. It was too quick. I'm like, damn. But then what happened? It didn't work for him. Then he tried again. Didn't work. Then he picked up the phone, called somebody up. He goes, what's the password? I'm thinking, the password? Anyway, so he's trying, yeah, that's not working. So anyway, I'm thinking, I'm going to guess this password before he does anyway. So I went running back to my desk. I guessed his password on the second try. The password was the same as his user ID, and he didn't even know that. Why? Because apparently he never logged his computer off to log back in. So anyway, that was a separate issue, and he had his computer logged in all night for everybody. So anyway, got access to all the CERT critical data from him, as well as all the people he shared, the, you know, as well as his entire department, since it was what's the password. Clearly, there were individual accesses, but they all shared, they had the same permission. So I stole every product the company was working on, and that was within a day and a half. And the, C the CISO said, Ira, I'll give you a three-hour head start if you want to head to Mexico at this point. I'm like, nah, that's OK. But anyway, going back to all this, you know, what did I do? I found one mark to get. I found one person to find my way in. Now, yes, in some cases, they did want to make a point. The reality, though, was I didn't find anything that found a repeatable solution to corporate problems. I didn't know if there was a repeatable problem. I knew, OK, people weren't wearing their badges. That's fine. But did I know if everybody checked to make sure people didn't tailgate in a door? No, I have no clue. Do I know if like everybody had default passwords? No, I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue about anything except how I got in. And yes, it made for a good story, but it didn't have any lasting effect on the organization's security posture. And that, I felt, was a failing. And so anyway, that's with stealing nuclear reactor designs. That's with stealing you know, like high tech type of stuff and all that. So what should social engineering be? It should really be, in the ideal world, a deeper vulnerability assessment where you see basic vulnerabilities. Now, how much further can we get? You want to see how it's practiced. But the key is you want to see how security is consistently practiced across your organization. Because again, as a security professional, you're not just concerned about getting one way in. You're concerned about systematic problems across the entire network. And that's the more critical aspect. What are the systematic issues? And you're not going to find it based upon what I did. 
You're not going to find it based upon a bunch of gotchas. Did I get like one guard who didn't check for IDs, who didn't check for proper authorization? I don't know. So again, it's just a bunch of gotchas. Now what you have to do is when you do social engineering, you need to construct your tests for generalizability. You need to look for are the behaviors you're witnessing consistent across the organization? You know, I mean, again, if you just got your gotchas and you wave your wand, I mean, what did I once hear somebody say? It's like, well, they were doing a penetration test and they met with the building manager saying they wanted to rent property. You know, they wanted to rent an office space, so they went to the building manager and then they cloned the building manager's like access card. I'm like, okay, so what are you gonna tell your people? It's like, congratulations, I'll tell my building manager not to share the card and I'll make sure I have a different set, I'm on a different like, you know, I have the upgraded plan that doesn't allow for cloning like that. That's not like a justification for a good enhanced security program. But anyway, you gotta take into account, are there different or organizations within your organization that are better at security awareness? Are you right, like you can't, like how many people ha like actually have different awareness programs for their IT department, for HR, for their maintenance staff, and they're, you know, just regular white collar workers. Very few people, they all share the same, you know, sorry, I don't wanna say crappy CBTs, but I guess I just did. But they all share the same crappy CBTs to say we're all gonna be aware. You don't know if certain pockets are better than others. You don't know if there are certain divisions. For example, I could tell you the security awareness profile in Latin America is very different than the security awareness profile in somewhere like Milwaukee, where everybody tries to be nice to each other. And then even when you do social engineering, I once did a social engineering test and we quickly adapted because we found out that me with my pseudo New York accent was not gonna get any results while this woman who works with me, who's from Minneapolis, got incredible results. Why? Because they automatically knew, we're a Midwest company. Why is that, you know, nobody would have this accent inside our company. You've gotta understand to profile, not just the organization, but who's doing your social engineering test as a whole. Are women having more success than men? Are men having more success than women? Are different people with different accents having more success? And you need to understand that as you're doing these tests for generalizability for how you can improve the overall security posture. And then also, here's a critical thing on the bottom. Are there technical countermeasures that can offset poor awareness? And now what I'm gonna tell you is proactive data collection is key. How many of you, when you do a social engineering test, say, before I go into this organization, I'm gonna need X number of people from here, I'm gonna need X number of people from there, I'm gonna need Y from there, I'm gonna make sure I get people, I'm gonna eliminate the IT people and so on, and you're actually proactively looking for the sample of your organization. You've gotta look across the organization and understand where are different people successful and where are different people failures and try to see if it's by job function or whatever else you can do because you're not shooting for gotchas. You're trying to secure the organization. That's your job as a security professional. Here's another thing with social engineering and stuff. How many of you actively try to be caught? That's a very good thing, when you try to be caught. When I do a social engineering test, and I'm gonna talk about this specifically, there has to be, you know, depending on the scenario I got, unless it's a gotcha, but try to go in with very, very specific scripts. I want to see if I call somebody up, for example, and say, hi, I'm with the IT department. We need to make sure your antivirus software is up to date and your system's offline. I go, can you please go into your registry file and let me know what this line, line 37 says in your registry file. They're like, excuse me, what's a registry file? I go, okay, well, in that case, can you give me your user ID and password so I can log in over the network to do that? And they're like, um, no, I can't. I'm like, check, I w they win, I win. I found where this person is. Now, what is the percentage of those people? And then perhaps I get somebody who says they won't do that. I go, okay, if you're not gonna give me your user ID and password, how about you open up a, com you know, you open up a window and type in reg edit and open it up and then please tell me what's on line 36. In other words, will these people take commands from somebody over the phone? Or if I say, okay, if you don't wanna do that, please go to this website and do that. Will, what level of awareness is there? How much can I push people before I get them to give? That's a critical distinction you need to know. What is specifically, is their level of awareness and so on? And then also, do they report something? 
If they find that there is, somebody asked me for their password, do they know who to report it to and how to report it and is it tracked? And frankly, is it investigated as an incident because just because you're doing a social engineering test, it doesn't mean there's a real criminal who's not out there doing the same thing. So the security team should say, hey, we have a report. Yes, was this you? Because if it's not you, it might be someone else. Because we have been in an incident where somebody called me up. We were doing a firewall assessment, let alone not a social engineering test. And the people called up and said, Ira, we told you not to do social engineering. OK, I got it. They told, I, I'm like, I know, I'm not doing social engineering. They're like, well, somebody just called up our IT people wanting to know the version of firewall we're running. I go, I didn't ask that. Like, what do you mean? That was a real test? I go. That was a real incident? I go, yeah, that was a real incident. They're like, I don't believe you. Luckily, we had somebody from the company behind us watching what we were doing because they wanted to report, and we made them get on the phone and tell them, no, they didn't call up. So anyway, you've got to make sure that the reporting processes are in place and accurate, and frankly, even don't assume it's you. And here's a critical thing. Simultaneously, when you're doing social engineering, what you should do is you should have your pretext laid out in advance, and you should say, here's the distribution of where I'm going to test and how I'm going to test. And you want to go in advance and say, here's what my report should look like. What is the susceptibility? Anyway, I think that's on the next slide. So for example, if I go in and how do I determine what I'm going to do in advance? I look at the company size. I look at different locations that might be within bounds. So if I have, for example, three locations with 1,000 people scattered, and I know the distribution is probably 50, 30, 20, and then when you do a social engineering test, you can't test everybody. You can't get on the phone, for example, and call pe 1,000 people up. That's not practical. Like if you're going to do a USB drop, you can't drop you know, like 1,000 USBs in front of everybody and see how they do it. You've got to sample your distribution and say, OK, if I drop 25 USBs around location 1, 15 around location 2, and 10 around location 3, is there a different result based upon where I do this? Do I get different results based on calling people up and asking for a password? Again, for example, like I mentioned, if maybe if one location's in the Midwest and you have people from California like, yo, dude, you know, what's your password? You know, that's probably not going to work around the Milwaukee area. On the other hand, you know, you, you might want to see, is there a reason why there's a distribution? Is it in your testing methodology? Because just because you either succeed or fail, that's not a matter of your own success or failure if you, unless you consider how you plan. So look at that as well. But proactively, when you write, you should write your reports of social engineering in advance to say, here's how I studied, where I studied. Then you need to fill in the blank on what was the success rate. And yes, does this mean it's like, wait a second, I made 100, I made 40, you know, I made 50 calls. Everybody answered at location one. Nobody's answering at location two or three. Well, maybe you've got to figure out why nobody's answering. They're like, but no, I want to get 100 calls. It doesn't matter. If you're doing a social engineering test and you do 100 calls and all 100 calls are for one location in the middle of the Philippines where they're afraid to say no to any American, that doesn't mean the rest of the company is going to be that insecure. You might have pockets of security. Here's a big thing. Statistics are critical to social science. I see too many people, when they look at awareness, they look at social engineering, they're saying, well, I took an NLP class. Or I took psychology. I'm, I'm talking about mental models. That's psychology of the individual. As a person who wants to secure the business, you need to understand the business. The sciences relative to the business are sociology, organizational psychology, and um, behavioral science to a large extent because behavior creates, consistently creates the culture. So you need to understand what is the culture of the organization like how do you measure that? Not just, I tricked this one person because I developed rapport. That's irrelevant to securing the organization as a whole because you can't go to every person around and say, I need to sit you down and give you a personalized lesson in awareness for 250,000 people. You need to look and understand your job is risk management. You're not going to, I promise you, you will, no matter what you do, 4% of people will click on a phishing message. I promise you, no matter what you do, 2% of people will click on a phishing message that says, this is a phishing message. If you click on this, it will ruin the network. They will still click on that message, so understand that. But you need to force your collection samples because, again, like I mentioned before, you're studying the organization and the organization as a whole, not the individuals. So while psychology is great for gotchas, you want to understand the organization, not the individuals. 
pretexts have to be specifically defined. I already covered this. Like, I'm going to go through a specific script that's going to test the level of awareness. If I keep getting stopped, maybe I want to raise the level of awareness and so on. But you can target your awareness training better. I'll cover that on the next slide. It's also not just voice simulations. It's not just voice. You can do tailgating simulations and have people trying to tailgate into a building behind everybody. And that's also critical. To see the number of people who get stopped or the number of people who influence. Yes, I know I'm almost done. Clean desk policies. Do you walk around Friday afternoon during lunchtime to see how many people leave their computers unlocked and so on? You're testing behaviors. Social engineers will say, I found somebody who left their computer open, so I text. I sent out a message saying donuts are on me on Monday. You know, that's funny. It doesn't give you the good statistics. Collect statistics consistently. You know, are, on, are entrances unsecured and so on? What is the consistent measurement of that? And then you've got to integrate your findings into awareness because everybody's like they have one thing and they think social engineering, the way to do this is now to tell people, we tricked you by this, so don't fall for this. The problem is there's a thousand ways people do things wrong. You need the one way people do things right. Awareness should not be afraid telling people to be afraid of the wascally wabbit if you know the Bugs Bunny Elmer Fudd analogy. You need to tell people, here's your job, here's how you do it right. And to do that, when you have physically gone, or, sorry, when you have gone ahead and statistically said, here's my, aware, here's my social engineering case studies to measure the level of awareness, do they fall for basic attacks? or they, nobody fell for basic attacks, they didn't fall for mid-level attacks, so I can really up my awareness to getting people aware of really, really advanced concepts, like spear phishing. I could give people advanced concepts like travel security in a foreign hotel and stuff like that. That's not an introductory topic. You need to make sure you consistently target awareness to the level of susceptibility to people, and unless you go ahead and take measurements statistically, you will not know that. And more important, you need to make sure it's repeatable. Because when I do my results, when you do a gotcha test, how many people think you can repeat the gotcha on the same person? Well, frankly, a few times you can. But there's some people are really bad. But the reality, though, is if you have 1,000 people and you're only do testing 50 people, you can retest 50 different people if you statistically sample those people appropriately. So anyway, that's part of the critical aspects. One warning, and this is not part of the presentation, but I hear too many people saying, well, I got this person, and yeah, well, everybody knows who it was, but don't worry, we, we use that for awareness. People get fired for that type of irresponsible behavior. You've got to understand this. There was one time I got a call. I did this test where a guard, we were breaking into a Fortune 500 company, walked in, got a guard to issue us a badge, and, you know, guard was being nice. I said, oh, so the guard was like, what do you guys do? I go, oh, we do computer stuff. She goes, do you want access to the server room? Well, yeah, we do, as a matter of fact. So anyway, got access to the server room, screwed up the whole company within a day. And then three weeks later, I get a call from this guy. He said, hi, I'm the facility manager. I need to know the name of the guard who gave you the badge. I'm like, what? Most people would say, oh, well, this person shouldn't. Here's the name. I'm like, what? I like, I go here, I go, no offense, I'm from Brooklyn, this is why I call, I go, no offense, I'm from Brooklyn, I have no idea who the fuck you are, and even if you are the fuck who you say you are, I'm not giving you the name, he's like, you've got to give me the name, I'm the manager, I go, I'm only, I don't know who you are, but I'm the, C you know, I'm only authorized to give out information to the CIO, and I will give the name to the CIO if the CIO asks me, however, if the CIO asks me, I will also let him know the fact the guard gave me the badge is bad, the fact you don't know who that guard is is infinitely worse. <laughs> so you got to make sure you don't put names, you don't infer who these people are, and statistical sampling takes away the blame because too many people like to make scapegoats. And frankly, I always try to steal something and screw up the CEO when I have a chance. Like, I would like to bug CEO offices, frankly. That's a good way to do things. Yeah, I have two minutes. But anyway, because if you say you got the CEO and especially the secretary, Nobody will be blamed because nobody gets the CEO secretary in trouble. That's a given. So you've got to make sure. Do not irresponsibly mention somebody, record somebody, or whatever that can identify them because people will be fired for, frankly, just reflecting the level of intelligence or the level of awareness of the organization. But remember, this whole thing should drive the level of awareness training you give. Conclusions, you can't just have a game of gotchas unless that's what the company wants. It's got to be designed to be proactive to provide value. You have to determine what 
what pretexts you're going to use, along what organizations, what facilities, if there's demographics, because that's the only thing you could do because you want to have repeatable results. If you want to have a good awareness program, you can go back and say like, hey, we did social engineering against 50 people, which represented 5% of the organization, and then we went back and statistically resampled with scientific validity, and we got social engineering susceptibility down from 80% down to 5%. And if you could do that with a scientific basis, that's how you get your money. Because the problem with security people is, and especially dealing with human factors, you security people get the budgets you deserve, not the budgets that you need. And what you need to do is you need to learn how to deserve more. When you could start to statistically sampling stuff and doing it in a scientifically valid way and saying, here's statistics on how well we improve and the monetary implications of that, you will get the budgets that you need, not just what you deserve. Anyway, buy my book. My book is awesome. Not on sale here, bad for them. And then my next book is going to be titled You Can Stop Stupid. Everybody okay with that title? Yeah, everybody like anyway. No, I, we were it's it's hard. The title's the most important part of the book. You know, Twitter can't stop stupid. That's me. I don't know if I have time for any questions, but I'll take them if they don't kick me out. I hate to be rude to for some people. Okay, questions outside. Thanks.